everybody's taking time away from their family. So with that, why don't we just get rolling? Um, so, um, you know, this is you know, the folks you're going to be talking to. Um, you know, so I'm John Stahl, CEO of Lean Dog. Um, started Lean Dog about 14 years ago. And when we first started Lean Dog, um, we started and founded the uh, Cleveland Agile Meetup, um, which Chris has been actively managing. So thank you for Chris for that. Um, you know, after that, um, uh, I was in Pittsburgh actually coaching with um, uh, uh, Jeff Patton, another great Agilist, and um, was there and realized we didn't have a pit Agile meet meetup. So we started that one and we've been paying for that meetup for years, not just the, the meetup dues, um, but Jeff and gang has done a great job. In fact, if you look at the stats there, um, even though Jeff's only 10 years old, um, they got more events and more members than the other cities. So, um, and, uh, and then a year later, we uh, founded and started the Buffalo Agile meetup. So that's kind of how this came together with COVID. Um, and then Brian's one of our agile coaches and he started a Columbus Business Agility Conference um, a few years ago. And so, you know, originally we were, we were calling this a Tri-City Meetup because as all of you organizers and all these great communities do, um, one of the hardest thing is getting, you know, speakers and facilitating and donating your personal time away from your families um, to create these communities. And with COVID and everybody being distributed, um, we thought, well, okay, why don't we, we're all remote. Why don't we try to bring these all together? So I think it's pretty cool um, that we actually have four cities involved. Um, I actually am from Pittsburgh. I grew up in Pittsburgh. Um, I actually went to Ohio State, so that's my tie to Columbus. Um, we do a lot of coaching in Buffalo, New York. Um, and, you know, and so that's kind of, you know, it's kind of been uh, the closest community, not on an airplane for me. Um, so the thought was, okay, why don't we do something different? And over the years, um, I got to become good friends with James and John um, through speaking at conferences, uh, working together, collaborating. And we thought, okay, I'm going to call out a couple of favors and ask two good friends if they would give up their evening um, to talk to us about, you know, 20 years after the, you know, 21 years after the Agile Manifesto was created, um, what's, what's new, like what's going on in the world. So, um, so we're going to get on with the agenda. Um, again, thanks to James and John. Um, we have another Lean Dog Coach, Jeff, that'd be the moderator and facilitate that. Um, but our agenda right now is we're a little bit behind schedule already, but um, we're just kicking it off right now. Uh, Kevin Civic's going to kind of take it from here and we're going to do a little bit of breakout because everybody knows um, the best part about these meetups and conferences and everything we do is, is a networking piece. So we're going to do a little bit of virtual for about 30 minutes uh, and then we're going to turn it over to Jeff to run the panel and then get everybody back home to their families. So um, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Well, thanks, John. Um, so the Buffalo meetup sort of starts like this pretty often where we, we send people out just to, to meet someone new, to get to know someone, um, and get to know their, their situation and maybe make a connection that can help you going forward. So we're going to do the same thing here. Um, and also going to ask you a, a little question, um, as we send you off to sort of trigger a little bit of conversation. Um, we'll be in the breakout rooms for, for maybe about 15 to 20 minutes. And then when we come back, if you have anything that you want to share with the bigger group, uh, you're free to, if not, then we'll get into the rest of it. Um, so the, the question that I want you to sort of keep in mind af after you make your introductions and, and your connections is, uh, why do you think the authors of the manifesto got together? Um, what problem were they trying to solve originally? Uh, so if you can just sort of talk about that a little bit and, and come back and share what, what you come up with. I would appreciate that. And uh, that's sort of that. So I'm going to start the breakout rooms. We'll come back. Um, let's call it about 625 or so. Yeah. Everyone we'll should be back now. now. So welcome back. Um, so uh, does anyone have anything they, they feel like sharing about uh, sort of their conversation in the breakout rooms? Um, the, the sort of question that was asked was, what what do you think the the authors of the manifesto were trying to solve? What problem were they trying to solve when they got together and ended up with the manifesto? Ken, if you're raising your hand, you don't have to. You can just talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't want to speak over anybody at the same time. I think a general theme emerged, which was there were a lot of great ideas, but none of them were holistically effective at solving all of the problems or the the primary uh, problems that traditional uh, project and software uh, management um, presented. And it wasn't until they you know, took an approach that brought a lot of different ideas together and they were allowed to be distilled and formulated into what it ended up being that 
it, did it really become something effective? I, I think that's kind of what our group came up with more or less. I'll speak for our group. I took notes because everyone else was, was think, thinking hard. Um, they did pretty good. Tired of documentation, just let us do our stuff and deliver. Wanted meaningful results versus you know, giant requirements document, trying to do everything. No functionality until a big bang, which resulted in typical late learning versus iterative incremental development. Pretty good. I did not influence that or share any real things. In our group, um, I think the focus was traditional. Am I muted? I think it was mine. Okay. Um, traditional waterfall techniques just were not working. And the ways to improve them were represented in the Agile Manifesto, largely um, uh, flexibility. If you have a large project, you don't know the answers, you can't schedule it in a waterfall method and expect it to work. So you have to have interaction, incrementalism, your development, that kind of stuff. And probably the single biggest part of what differentiated beyond that flexible scheduling is the active involvement of the user, which if you have to, in my opinion, if you have to pick one predictor of the success of a project, it's the degree to which the user is active in the project. But uh, it was really in reaction to what wasn't working, which was the traditional waterfall type approaches. Say so Amos, you I know you have experience with the original agile software Lisp. How do you think today's agile world compares with the original Lisp world? Well, it's not as much Lisp as the type of projects, which was you know artificial intelligence expert system kind of things, where you were you were lucky enough to work on small projects. You were lucky enough to have a domain expert if you're the knowledge engineer, and you could demand and expect that. And what agile has in some sense done is to scale that up to bigger projects, more people, bigger deliverables, more of an expectation that we know in advance what we're gonna get, as opposed to we're exploring how we can do a system that will behave intelligently in some domain. We have a better sense of what we want, but we don't really know how we're gonna get there. So it's kind of like balancing degrees of uncertainty. There's less uncertainty, but there's also a lot more people and it's a bigger project. So it's kind of, it's just an evolution of we make bigger things that have to do more with more people involved and we don't know in advance and we have to be flexible. And that's really what it comes down to. I think this is kind of iterative incremental development on steroids. It used to be small projects with a few people and those are always still the easiest ones to deal with, you know, in so many ways. And I still love, you know, a three or four person project. You God, that's so much fun, right? But, um, yeah, that, that was the only way you could move to bigger projects with uh, any sort of flexibility. And as we did more and more things that came more and more complicated, it was clear we were gonna get screwed if we just uh, kept, um, you know, uh, let me defer. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks Amos. All right. Does anyone else have any? Yeah, those were important points by Amos. I wonder, you know, why don't we start with two or three person teams, get some kind of minimum project and then let a, another more organized team scale it up? Management support. <laughs> we used to do that at TogetherSoft. We kind of have a tiger team that would begin implementing the next rev and kind of scope it out with the new requirements and things like that and get it to a skeleton place and then roll roll the rest of the team into it and just keep leap, leapfrogging like that about every 18 months a brand new code line shocking as that sounds kicked ass beat ibm at their own game old to borland yay at progressive i had the opportunity to do quite a bit of that i was lucky enough to yeah i mean i was senior technical but i was not a I, I did not want to be a manager, but I was at that sort of pay level and whatnot. And I reported up to like the second tier of IT, which meant, 
you know, I could if something had to be done, I didn't have to worry about any political BS. I just had a few people, like maybe two or three people total, and we'd prototype something, and it was all the way up to the top, and we didn't have to worry about any any of the hoops to jump through as long as my boss was convinced we're doing something. And that is such an atypical situation in any sort of department in IT I've ever seen. So um, it, it comes down to, you've got to have some fairly senior sponsorship for that kind of approach. That gets you both the time and the high cover from political BS if you step on toes and start looking into an area that, well, that's somebody else's and why aren't you, you know, you know, there, there's a lot of impediments to small teams trying to get things started. Among other things, you know, the stovepipes of other groups feeling like, well, why aren't I involved? And all of a sudden you got a big team. So you need to have a flexible organizational structure and you need some very high level management support to enable that to happen. We didn't really know about collaborating back then as much. I mean, you had to, when things got really bad, you started collaborating. Mm -hmm. But you would work for months at a time, you know, kind of in, like you mentioned, the silos um, and a lot of effort into dividing things up so everybody could go have their own silent place to go work. Mm -hmm. So there's still a lot of that going on. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's probably the biggest, not just one way. I think the biggest silo is schema creation and maintenance. We still have these, you know, database administrators. The programmers are always trying to work around them. What do you all think? Yeah, I remember I was working with Stahl on a on a project. This, this was the embodiment of a matrix organization that materialized in front of my very eyes. I never thought I'd see a project Gantt start chart type resource allegation, you know, where the DBA came and said, hi, I'm your you know, point four tenths of a DBA. I will be here this day, this day and half of that and UX. Right? We only had partial. I thought, wow, this is crazy. Um, <laughs> And the DBA was at the, initially, we'll create the schema for you. I'm like, okay, son, I've been doing, and I'm, I'm an arrow guy, but I, I learned, I, found, I accidentally learned uh, SQL through using our base way back in the eighties. And lo and behold, it was like legit database commands that I learned. And I said, son, <laughs> let, let, me, let me listen. You know, I want to use you when it's really hard we can you know create schemas we can you know i know ddl we know ddl we'll create everything and he got it and he understood it and he actually said all right call me if you need me but you're right like you know that was from ground zero it was an impediment in trying to be imposed on the team and i was like no we're going to run at the pace we run we create classes we create tables we create classes tables but you know and don't put that kind of a you know process impediment in front of us and they did and we succeeded but yeah dbas are, are a classic so let's abstract that makes sense because when you, you need to be able to deal with other groups when you need and if they trust you they'll give you what you need and let you go back to whatever rather than saying well that's our area we need to control yada 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 which is what i was saying how it's hard to have a small team and it sounds like you had that good relationship with your dba who basically said okay look you know what you're doing if you need some help let me know when which is just, but you, you know, you, you don't want to have to have a team of uh, a cast of thousands to learn about a topic. Yeah, that phone a friend capability is really important. Be able to get some help from somebody that knows something. <clears throat> yeah, that's always my joke. I, I know when I need an expert. I'm not an expert in anything, <laughs> but I know when I need one. Yeah, by the way, I sent you an uh, advice email today, John. I don't know if you saw it. <laughs> Sound, sounds snarky. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I was looking oh. for some help. <laughs> okay. You didn't save me today. I had to save myself. <clears throat> so, John, uh, what was your perspective on the problem we were trying to solve at the Agile Manifesto? Oh, well... I don't know if we want to. Yeah, I don't know. Jeff needs to, you know, maybe jump in or, or Mr. Stahl. Well, I, I think you guys were just looking for an excuse to go skiing. 
You maybe had you a bad side bet. There was there was something mischievous going on. It wasn't all about <laughs> software development. I I haven't figured that one out yet. But no. That was a big part of motivation for choosing that site versus Anguilla. Yeah. In the, in the Caribbean, which was hard to get to. The only the only island I was ever at for my, for my honeymoon. I said, oh, it's a cool island, but it's a pain in the ass to get to it. Wait a minute. We were in Anguilla for our honeymoon, too. And it's I'm not going to say what year because that would that would that that would be a private message. But ninety two, whatever. I got <laughs> married later later in life. <laughs> I'm a little earlier than that, but yeah. yeah. So Sorry, uh, skiing was skiing was a big thing. Well, I mean, fun's fun's an important part of what we do, right? So if you aren't having fun, then why? You're right? in the so, wrong business. Yeah, exactly. So. But, right. I, I, but, but when, when I was early in my software career, um, and I worked with Amos at Progressive, um, I was young, I had no family, I had no, I could work more hours because I really had no commitments in life. And I got compensated based on how many, how many, how many lines of code I could throw over the wall to the next person, right, and make it their problem, if they hmm. can't test it or get it out, right. And, and so my first like, X years of my career, I worked with Amos, I mean, it, it was all about yeah, I, I could live there at work. I could work 60 hours and people had families and kids. So fun was not like respect amongst humans about, hey, we work a hard 40 and sustainable pace was not part of the waterfall mantra, right? It was throw it over the wall, throw it over the wall, throw it over the wall. And I was, you know, I had to be positioned my life, I could do that. But so I, I, I do think that that fun and the manifesto and you guys getting together and working hard, but working smart, um, you know, and balancing your life with your work. Um, I don't think that that was not part of the waterfall world. That wasn't part of the death march. That Well, uh, there's still, that's alive and well in the scrum world in some places, I think, mm -hmm. where everything is about, I'm going to use a bad word now. I'm sorry, I apologize in advance. Sprint. <laughs> so the sprint word, you've seen the Olympics, you know what happens. Um, sprint is not the right metaphor for what we do. Um, you know, so... I'm going to read some blogs about how people in development, you know, in engineering, why they hate agile and they list all this stuff, why they hate it. And it's pretty much, hmm, well, too bad you aren't doing agile because then you might not hate it so much. You're doing something else. You're being rushed by someone. You don't know how to work incrementally. And so you're feeling this pain because of uh, this incremental, because incremental management is forced on you and you don't know how to support that incremental delivery approach. And uh, so people are feeling the pain of that. So what, maybe, sorry, Denise, go ahead. Yeah. So guys, why are you saying sprint's a bad word? You like the word incremental better than sprint? What would be the word you would replace that with? Any word. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I don't you like sprint. You can't just say that. And, uh, I got lots of words, man. Um, <laughs> I, don't like, I don't like sprint. I don't think I have a picture handy for sprint. I've got uh, other pictures handy. Like, you know, you dig yourself in a hole. <laughs> and uh, you know the first law of holes if you find yourself in a hole stop digging stop digging but, uh, <clears throat> yeah so i don't like sprint because you well literally you've seen the olympics and you see what they expect of an Olymp olympic runner doing a sprint they're supposed to give everything for that whole sprint and then they could collapse at the end um now in scrum uh <laughs> Five minutes later, they got to get picked back up off the ground and given oxygen and do another one. Um, I just think it's the wrong metaphor. Yeah, but don't forget, they also take the last maybe 10 yards of the, of the track and add it to the next track. So, <laughs> so they, they almost never actually finish the race. <laughs> they drag a part of their track with them. Hey, let's do more. Yeah. Because we didn't before. Yeah. Right, okay. I, I do use Sprint. A lot because I'm a I'm a scrum master, <laughs> so. Well, everybody but I see, does. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, what we what I have seen is when I when we do the sprint review and we're, we're we're showing our customers what we're working on. There's been times where we're working on the wrong thing, either our assumption was there or the customer had a, a time to rethink really what they needed <clears throat> in that product. So, yeah. I mean, so I I think it's a value. I mean, we use safe. I work for Broadcom and we, and we do safe. So that's probably another bad word for you too. It's a four letter word. Yeah, well, no, it's, I don't have any <laughs> objection to safe. 
Okay. It is a Fort Lauderdale work. <laughs> but, I mean, I see the value in Sprint. I mean, because we, we cut our work down in little increments. So we, yeah. we do Oh, things. yeah. So I, I have nothing. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally in favor of incremental delivery, incremental development, and working yeah. in iterations. I just think Sprint gives the wrong idea because it yeah. makes people that, you know, are maybe not in the know of how to manage their work in a Sprint. Sprint, that just means go as fast as you can. Don't stop. Don't, don't stop. think. Just go fast. Yeah, but we, we call them iterations. We don't yeah. Yeah, we use the word sprint. Yep. Yeah, me as an XP guy, I call it iteration too. It seems to be yeah. a trend in that direction for many practitioners to use iteration in favor of, uh, as opposed to sprint. Does anybody have flexible sized iterations? I, I don't like the fact that it's every two weeks or four weeks. I think it, you know, it should be sized based on what is it we want to accomplish in the next block of time and you know, should that be two weeks? No, this go around four weeks on another one. I, I don't like the the rigorous fixed time slice concept. I think it kind of depends on where you are and what you're trying to get done. Yeah, yeah I think they're kind of training wheels. Yeah, I mean, I was the way to get started. Yeah, I could care care less. Uh, like maybe in the beginning, if you're trying to set a cadence and build a new team and build a new product, and you want to at least have some you know, some window to say, all right, well, at least within the next two weeks, we'll, we'll have the Hello World app or something like that. You know, that might make sense in the beginning, but I, I truly don't understand why a team that's working on a product for five years is still doing sprints. Like, well, why? Because, Sharon, you just said the magic words. The only thing I care about is, are we working on the right thing? Because... And I think Alan had a horror story where, you know, a, 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 a release showing to the clients only to learn, maybe it was internal customers, but only to learn, oh, that's not what we want. We don't need that anymore. Oh, darn, because we can't even, we can't easily even pull it out of the release. Uh, you know, that's the worst <clears throat> thing. You, you built the wrong thing. You'll never get the time back and you didn't spend the time building the right thing. And, you know, it's like the, you know, the, the project was canceled at $20 million. I always like to ask, well, what were you thinking at 19? It's the, uh, the and a miracle happens in the hockey stick or something like, uh, like, yeah, how that kind of thing happens is I like to say my, you know, I'll use the phrase, mind the gap the gap in time between doing something and getting feedback. You want that to be as small as possible, whether it's TDD, you know, getting tests, behavior development, getting some acceptance tests, or we're, we're really not sure about this UI, getting some feedback, you know, hey, subject matter expert, hey, user, can you look at this? Getting it way before any formal, official two-week sprint or sprint review. You know, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's much easier though to fall back on process safe is a beautiful awesome thing if you don't want people to have to think it's hard because you can just hide behind tons of process <laughs> and it's prescriptive so management loves it right so it's to me it's don't let go of that undying need to deliver the right thing at the right time to the customer and, and truly understand what value means for you and your team that's that's, I think Agile is the hardest, doing, well, at least doing Agile properly is the hardest so, thing to do because you can't rest. You can't relax. I kind of wonder how we uh, actually sur survived and succeeded with uh, planning for months, you know, on requirements and then executing and then delivering the wrong thing. You're going to redo stuff. Um, me, you know, the feedback loop for me should be pretty short because I'm my own customer when I'm building the infrastructure to help me run my business, like my website and such for, uh, for doing training. And um, I'll get into something and I'll deliver to myself the thing I thought I wanted. And as soon as I have it, I go, no, that doesn't work. That's not what I wanted. I wanted something kind of like that, but now I know more of what I want and I gotta work my way towards it. If instead I picked out in a lab, made an elaborate idea of what I wanted and then tried it, I would have the same problem because I'm not living it and software changes your uh, how you work. And so it's changing you as you're using it. So you're going to have to change it again. 
James, that's, that's a really powerful observation, the fact that you can't even deliver to yourself what you want. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think there's a lot of lessons to take away from that. All right, guys, I'm going to jump in for a second here because we've gotten way down to some of the challenges that we're being faced with uh, with here for a moment. And I'd like to get back to the question. We're going to come back to this. We're going to take shots at Scrum later. We'll take shots at Safe uh, and, and describe those a little bit. But before we get to those, I, I'm still curious, James and John, we haven't heard the official answer. I'd love to hear what, and maybe you can start by talking a little bit about how were you working in the 90s that led up to you coming together in 2001 um, in, and, and creating that manifesto. But, you know, you know, I'd love to maybe hear from, from you, what problem were you trying to solve when you came together? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll certainly go. I was working in DOD, Defense Department type projects, um, flight simulators or centrifuges and uh, mission planning systems and things like that. So I was exposed for the first time to Bill Standard 2167, and then there was some other, another one. But there literally was a mill spec for how to do software development. And it had all kinds of acronyms and all kinds of processes to, to work. And as some of the demands from the customer wanted the certain documents and things like that, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, ah. Oh, Man, I'm a taxpayer and this is just, you know, we're doing research and development and we're trying to predict what we're going to do for a whole year in, in, in actual, it's not like production work, it literally was R and D. So of course the whole mantra there is, I don't know, learn and adapt and learn and adapt and, and right. So it was a complete antithesis to what we were doing. So I found out quickly to build a rapport with the customer and look, this is the pile of money we got. This is the, the outcomes we're looking for. Let's just work together and do the right thing for our, our goal. And so the, the heavyweight processes like rational unified process and that kind of crazy ass large process doc waterfall type process. That's what I experienced back then. And as a engineer and as somebody itching just to get things done, and show progress they were there was just it was like the hell's wrong with you software people this is just stupid like why do you work like this <laughs> and, and so that's what i recall at the time you know there was a ton of marketing around ibm and rup and not much around what we were doing with peter Co i was working with peter code feature driven development and then james you can take it over for, for what you were working on <clears throat> all right okay i'll go back in the wayback machine a little bit further um <clears throat> In the 80s, I, was, I started off in the government kind of stuff too with the FAA. And luckily, the company I went into, they were pretty immature. But our second project was, here's all the documents you have to produce. And it was, you know, we had to do a lot of a lot more upfront work than we did in our first project. I left that company and went to another company, in, which was total chaos. And this is where I met Bob Martin. We worked together in the in the 80s at a company called Teradyne in the Chicago Burbs. And uh, total chaos. And part of what I was going there for is to help them get some process. And so we were trying to learn waterfall. And we actually got better by trying to learn waterfall, but it turned out big waterfall didn't work, but a lot of little waterfalls weren't too bad. And so we made a bunch of little waterfalls and kind of worked. Um, not really um, intending to, you know, discover anything, but it just, we wanted to plan it out. And we went from chaos to something better. Um, the 90s, the 90s, OO was getting uh, a lot of traction and iteration was, you know, a possibility. You shouldn't just do it all at once. You should do things, you know, and then in 1999, I'm invited to uh, the uh, <clears throat> first extreme programming immersion when uh, Bob, Bob Martin's company had an arrangement with uh, Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham and Ron Jeffries and uh, Martin Fowler to start training people and we had a big event and it was kind of shocking all the things the practices of extreme programming and now to the to the question about what problem we we're trying to solve as extreme programmers uh, we were pretty clear in the training classes at least by the second one what we're trying to do and why you would care the first uh, extreme program immersion was attended by the acolytes <laughs> the people that were already uh, following Kent Beck and and 
Martin Fowler and Ward, <clears throat> who was attended by them, you know, so everybody was kind of believers. But then other crowds were more uh, doubters, and we had to change our approach, which is what problem we're trying to solve. And so what problem we're trying to solve, you know, Kent and Ward were amazing to have actually solved some of these problems. Uh, we're late a lot. The quality is bad and people are getting burned out and customers are dissatisfied. All these things, these were the problems that um, we were trying to solve. Now, those are pretty grandiose problems, but you could actually take some of the practices of extreme programming and development and such and draw a fairly short logic chain to solutions to those problems where you might get somebody to say, okay, I'll give it a try. And um, <clears throat> so that's kind of the, the roots as, as I kind of see it. And I, I find that uh, those problems are still with us today in a large extent. And uh, yeah, and I would just add the original, you know, how when you go to a conference in a hotel and they'll have something up on the monitors. Uh, I think there's, if you go to Agile Uprising, I know there's, there's some uh, artifacts that <clears throat> I, you know, I uploaded some of my notes and things like that, but there was a original sign. It was about lightweight methodology. Oh yeah. So yeah. You got so uh, hint that we were, we, there was a bun bunch of lightweight methodologists yeah, that was uh, yeah versus heavyweight. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so the thing, yeah, so you're fighting. So what was the uh, group pulled together about? And so, you know, as an extreme programmer, I was there to solve those problems because those are engineering problems, and I wanted to solve those. But what this group was about, as I as I recall, and it was a long time ago, um, was IBM was buying up Rational and all the tool companies, or maybe this was Rational buying up all the tool companies, and then IBM bought them. Um, and processes were just getting bigger and bigger and the weight was getting larger on people rather than getting smaller. Even though there was a way to do RUP really small, that wasn't the direction that anybody, any RUP consultant was pushing anybody. Um, and so the, uh, I think the lightweight methods and we're interested in doing things with less baggage and, um, the, um, um, funny thing Ward said as soon as we got into the room together oh and I will tell you tell you all I did go to go skiing you know so when Bob says do you want to go to snowbird and do blah 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 it's like yes the answer is yes so I definitely want to you just heard the snowbird part <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so I'm, cu I'm I'm curious sorry James I, I, I'm, I'm curious there you, you talked about RUP and you talked about XP and and all of these processes that were in there and yet none of these processes made it into the manifesto. The manifesto is it came up with with other words. I'm I'm curious as to how that happened and how none of these processes sort of showed up in uh, in the manifesto. It was uh, well, I think it was very on purpose. So John was there representing FDD, and Alistair Coburn, one of the his key organizer, he was there um, uh, with his crystal approach. He and uh, um, Jim, James Highsmith. Jim, yeah, Jim Highsmith, yeah. And uh, Steve Meller was there because he was into model-driven approaches. And uh, Bob and me and Kent and Ward and Ron were there because we were extreme programming. And uh, and then you had the Schwaber and company there with Scrum. And I don't know. Did, what Ari, was, Ari was DSDM. Uh, DSDM, yep, Ari with DSDM. And then uh, Brian Merrick. Tester. Test, you know, bring a test perspective. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Uh, so the word lightweight, you know, kind of brought us together to try to get some baggage off our shoulders. And Ward right away in the room says, we're going to need a, a different name. Um, who wants to be known as a lightweight? And uh, I that's that funny. I, I, I attribute that to Alistair for some reason. I don't know. Oh, yeah. so that's, well, that's one of the beauties of the whole, <laughs> like, if you, if you grilled, all of us independently with the same question, you get some overlapping, you know, sort of correctness, and then a lot of fuzziness, which I think is a testament to the fact that uh, there were a lot, you know, there are some pretty famous people in the room. I, I wasn't one of them. Me neither. But I was. They left, they left their egos at, you know, we left our egos at the door. The idea was, is there some, you know, we're a bunch of modelers, a bunch of people who can abstract things and, and build, build you know, a, a problem domain space type thing. <clears throat> so I think of it as we were attempting to 
look across these lightweight methodologies to see what was the gist, what things bubbled up that were kind of consistent. And that's why it was abstract. And that's why no methodology, at least to my knowledge, <clears throat> really a, 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 a quest for kind of digging into why are we successful with these smaller, less marketed methodologies than, you know, rock. So Jeff's asked a question in the chat. I'm going to do a, a sort of a precursor to that one before we get to it, um, because I'd love to know before we get to today, um, if you were facing these problems in the 80s or 90s, which is Jeff's question, how do you think we've evolved or how do you think the world has changed in the last 20 years? And the follow up to that is going to be Jeff's question is how do we move the needle starting now? But let's maybe start with with the first the last 20 years. How have things how have things changed? Or have they changed in the last 20 years since you guys got together um, and, and came up with this? Can I add one thing to what John was saying? Of course. It's, it's a, I think it's a real uh, critical thing that we are trying to do that doesn't get done enough these days, which was uh, something that I know our, the company I worked for in the 80s was, was teaching us, which is what do we agree on? Can we find out what we agree on? Because then we can do something about what we agree on and not focus instead of what we don't agree on, because then we'll never get out of that battle. But if we could find what we do agree on, then that's where those four points came from. We had note cards, you know, because there were a bunch of extreme programming people there. So you, of course you have note cards. I'm sorry, did not. Uh... Good point. <laughs> so where have we come in the past 20 years? I think the most heartwarming things are you know, from being, uh, you know, speaking at various places around the world, especially recently in not the U.S. So it's almost as if, you know, whether it was uh, Greece or Colombia or India, places are, I don't want to say freshly discovering, but certainly freshly embracing the Agile Manifesto. And just the sheer, um, and, and this, is ha this happened from, you know, almost moments after we, you know, Ward said, hey, why don't you throw us up on the web? Yeah, sure, why not? Who cares, right? I doubt anybody, anything will happen, right? Nobody, nobody thought anything was going to happen. So it was just, yeah, you might as well. We came up with something, share it. Not, oh yeah, this is going to be huge. Just can't wait to start selling certificates for this. Um, but anyway, the, to me, <laughs> millions of people were spoken to. I think a couple of people in the room, breakout room mentioned how, or, or, or um, at least it might, it might've been, might been Jeff mentioned how it spoke to him. And, and that sentiment across cultures, across languages, that's the thing that is the most heartwarming. It, it, it's, it's as if like, thank God, I'm not crazy. All this weird stuff that we're supposed to do is, is bullshit and here's something that I can grab onto that finally makes some pragmatic sense. And I feel like it, it, it unleashed millions of people, at, at least with a chance, you know? So, you know, so you're like the old uh, dumb and dumber, like, so you say I have a chance, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think that, you know, that's really what happened. So are people still doing stupid stuff? Yeah, well, welcome to free choice and free will, right? Um, but millions of people got to experience better ways of delivering software. And some people have done it and that's it propelled their, their companies and organizations. Other folks can't figure it out. So, you know, so be it. We can't solve world hunger either. It might actually be easier than, than helping people deliver software more smartly. Well, the number of develop, developers the amount of software being developed every year is so much more than the year before. So there's a much bigger chance that you'll do it the way that the people around you are doing it than some other way. Uh, you know, so you actually have to be kind of looking for a solution to problems actually bump into this stuff, you know, so. Good point. John, so, you mentioned that uh, you suggested, so someone suggested putting it up online and people were like, yeah, okay, whatever. But that raises the question of what were you actually intending to do with the output of this gathering? 
were you just going to take it back and and employ these ideas in your own workplaces or did you have a broader strategy in mind uh no broader strategy a curious gathering with skiing and beer <laughs> um and i think it was just in the spirit of the oops law the other other types of gatherings what, what were some of the ones i never got to go to but i read about them uh like i want to say they were maybe in the northwest and they were they were about patterns, you know, whatever those, whatever some of those gatherings were. And then they would publish maybe, you know, some pages of findings. So I think it was along that, that line, like, oh, well, we, at least we came up with some bullets and some later, some principles might as well share. Them. So yeah, there were remember no talk at all about any kind of um, downstream thought I, I like i don't remember anything strategic <laughs> zero it was really just what the hell can we do to combat the one giant marketing gorilla in the room that's spewing crap and a terrible way to do software yet we have a bunch of smaller players it's almost like uh hey can we form a union that you know let's <laughs> let's call it you know or the cooperative or something uh right, so John, yeah. who, 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 threw up, who, who threw up the web page Word. Word. We worked on that's when I first learned about the wiki because we, we worked on his wiki. So I was like, oh, wiki, that's cool. Huh. I learned a lot in that meeting. I, I learned about Scrum and DSDM, never heard of either of those. Yeah. yeah. Or FTD. <laughs> well, that I knew and I knew XP. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 So I, um, I've heard Bob, I don't remember this from the time, but I heard, I've heard Bob explained that a manifesto was something that he would he wanted us to come up with in the meeting um i kind of thought that was martin's objective too but uh martin followers but um you know there was a uh, kind of a push to find out what we agreed on and to write something down do you remember at the time what uh what brought besides the skiing what what it was that that sort of pulled you into this in the place and and how the 17 of you came to be the 17 that were invited well, if you were involved in extreme programming in 1999 you think oh my gosh we can we can save the world <laughs> uh, because uh it was a radically different way of working that i'm like still shocked to this day that ward and kent came up with 10 practices at or whatever number it is 12 uh, practices that fit together so nicely and help solve real problems and don't add a bunch of weight to your shoulders. Um, and so I, as an engineer wanting to find better ways to work, I was really interested in helping to promote that and hang out with the guys that, you know, were creating that. Um, certainly that was big for me. <clears throat> and then to walk in the door and hear all this, hear all this talk about people and people problems, it's like, wait a second, I'm an engineer. Uh, I didn't come here for this people stuff. And uh, but they were right, you know, most problems are people problems. So. So maybe I can dig in on that one a little bit more because we often hear of people process and technology as sort of the holy trinity of things that, uh, that, that come together. And the manifesto seems to very much be focused on people. And I'm, I am surprised, James, and, and you just sort of alluded to it there, that 17 engineers, 17 <laughs> software people, 17 people came together and really made a focus on people not process and technology and i'm i'm surprised um that that given the group of people that were there uh, that there is such a strong people fo focus i'm wondering do you have any recollection of that or how you've seen it play out since since well, 2001? I, I would blame uh <laughs> alistair and ward um so i'd been seeing alistair for a while out there because I, I had a contract job out there and we went skiing a few times uh, and we got to talk about software on the rides up and dodge moguls on the way down. And uh, so it was interesting to talk to him. It's like, you know, yeah, that XP is a great thing, but, you know, process doesn't matter as much as the people. You know, if you get good people, they'll come up with a good way to work together. And so it's really about people and blah, blah, blah. And he tells me all the things he studied. And so he was, you know, he's not a quiet guy. And uh, he was very, um, you know, a proponent of the people thing is really important. And and Ward is a, is a quiet guy and recognize the same thing. You know, so you have these two uh, really smart guys helping us see <laughs> that people really matter a lot. I don't know. That's kind of my 
my recollection of it. Um, I kind of forget where some of the other people were, but yeah. I, I, those are the two strong personalities in that. And and I to me anyway. I remember one of the exercises I think led by Martin about those cards, write, writing words on them that that mattered, and then we went over it. And you know, I know I think at least one of the things I wrote was maybe honesty. You know, the like the illusion of a project plan and Gantt charts and and the whole waterfall and the and the, the big bang, you know, and then or the big reveal type thing. You know, that that's just you can't be 98% done with a feature. It's either done or not, right? I mean, it's that whole um just just get off of that kind of uh, illusion. And I think possibly some of the other you know, as as folks describe their processes, some of the gists that sort of bubbled up might have been the, re the realization of how important the conversations were to being successful. You know, the conversations, you know, it, it, if you can imagine my DOD days and working with contracts and, and client, you know, the, the mill standard specifications, all that gobbledygook. And then you look at those bullets, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to understand why things are this over that because, um, the process and tools are easy in, in a, in a, from a large degree. It's the interactions. It's the <clears throat> make sure you have, <clears throat> build that rapport with the customer. Make sure you have the ability to respond to changes because in an R&D world, especially, you know, don't get so wedded to your damn plan and don't plan so far out. Things like that, right? It, it's not hard to see why those, those, those bullets tackled what I would call more the, the difficult challenges in reality, doing software in, with more than just James being the customer and James being the, the crappy developer that doesn't satisfy the customer sometimes, right? That's, that's an easy doesn't problem. know what they want and the developer doesn't know how to build it. <laughs> right. So I think so, that's why it came out, you know, people oriented. So I, I remember I hear talking that. To asking Sorry, Kent about, uh, well, Ken, wouldn't it be good if we could get the customer to sign off on a document saying that's what they want? And he goes, well, you could put some energy into that if you want to, but it won't, ch it won't stop them from changing their mind. They're going to change their mind anyway. So get good at change instead. It's like, oh, yeah, okay. Okay, let's go get good at change. Now, <laughs> yeah, nicely diffusing that. Uh, so that I long hear felt important thing. I hear you talk about this, and it's not the first time that I've heard this sort of sentiment come out about how valuable people are and the interactions and and folks. And yet, so many of our organizations, and we we caught the we we caught this earlier as the conversation earlier started off that that so many folks have taken agile to mean I need to stand up for fifteen minutes a day and I have to write all of my requirements in a goofy format. Um, and in order to do that, that'll make me agile. Totally missing, um, I think, some of the the key things that that you're, you're alluding to and, and, and saying here. What are some things in, in your opinion, in your experience that you've seen that maybe could help us evolve beyond standing up for 15 minutes a day? I, I mean, I've seen people suggest that we should do a 15 minute plank every day um, as an alternative, but I'm not sure that's the solution. I don't think I could do that. No. I'm not sure what my max plank has been, but that's pretty rough, <laughs> 15. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I break down after maybe two, maybe three minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But good idea. You get good at it. People can't talk so well when they're face down either. <laughs> okay, so it's just people lose, lose sight of what problem they're trying to solve. Why did Ken suggest a 15 minute meeting every day? So that people would talk to each other and find out what they're doing and see if we could help each other. Um, I, I don't believe that everything's going well every day, you know, but do people go through the motions of that thing? Because the important part is going through the motions because that's what somebody said they needed to do is go through the motions. Um, why not instead find a way to solve real problems? So as an engineer, I would, might want to ask what problem are we solving by doing that? And if somebody could tell me a good reason why, and then I might actually come to that meeting and contribute to try to help solve that problem. But if I don't know what problem I'm trying to solve by doing a stand-up meeting, I'm going to just think, okay, another ritual. Okay, I can do it. Keep my boss happy. Meet him every day instead of only once a week. Um, it seems like a waste of my time, but um, 
<laughs> if you were actually getting something out of it, it wouldn't be a waste of time. Now, uh, one of the evolutions of that is mob programming. Instead of waiting till once a day to ask people for help, you just work together all day long. It's like, oh, and my, a pair program was the same idea. Let's together have two people that can more quickly solve problems and two people individually. But the keyboards aren't active. James, here's an inactive keyboard right here. No one's typing on it. Yeah, okay, so what? <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's kind of the key is really to understand. I mean, I don't know why there's all this martial arts stuff in the software world, um, but like Shu Ha Ri, that, that kind of thing. And I think Shu is not the thing on your foot, but it has to do with I'm, I'm learning, I'm following a recipe. Uh, and so that's okay to start, right? If, I, if I'm baking or, or cooking, I might follow the recipe. Um, maybe because I've cooked more, I could tweak it on the fly the first time because I have ideas about the impact of that. And, and the blast radius is small. And I think if you merely go through the motions and don't understand why, to James' point, that's the flaw. That's the... And that's why a lot of companies love safe because there's a lot of motions. There's beautiful templates of things you can do. You know, like I'm pretty sure if I take the safe diagram and put my finger on it, close my eyes, you know, it's got agile and lean stuff that I'm not going to argue with. Um, because it's all the kinds of things that, that I, I dearly love and, and practice and follow. But it's how do you put that together? It's, it's how do you, you know, how do you think about things in terms of the return on that investment, whether did you do too much documentation up front or not enough? Right. Cause you can all, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, a, they're I'm both actually, a problem. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a, it's that you take that opportunity to reflect on what you did, what value it presented. Could you have done less? Like try to be lazy, try to get, try to do a little bit. Like someone asked about MVP. You'd be shocked sometimes of how really am I can go and deliver like a really, really, really small, way less than necessary first step in the right circumstance with the, with the right customer, you know, that I can do like in a SaaS app. So it's only them, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very, the blast radius is controlled. But the idea there is that's a, take the smallest step, be humble, get feedback as soon as possible. Uh, you know, and, and, and that goes with all the processes like MVP, could you've done less? Like I often say, think of the smallest thing you can do and then do slightly less. Because <clears throat> you can always do more. You can never get back extra, you know, wasted time. That'll never come back. But you can oh. always go, oh crap, that didn't taste good. Okay, add some more salt. You can't take yep. salt out once you, you know, once you over salt it, right? It's, <laughs> it's uh, I don't know, it, but this is hard. Because a lot of it is perspective flexing. It's how can you have empathy with the customer how can you sort of stand out beyond yourself and, and have a different perspective about what you're doing? So I'm not saying it's easy for everyone, but um, yeah, that's, that's, to me, it's, it's be a little more critical of why we do things, try to understand it. I want, I want to keep going down this road, but uh, before we do, Amos has a question here. So I wanted to uh, get you in, Amos. Uh, are you able to unmute yourself there? Uh, there's perfect timing by the way it's pronounced famous like famous famous cookies sorry but, about that that's okay but anyway uh, uh we we just heard mention the customer and you know that from my experience and you know it may not have all been agile but it's been you know many decades and probably the single most important thing was having FaceTime with the customer, having them see what you're doing, having you understand what their business issue are, viscerally understand so that, you know, you can make the decisions or you can ask the questions and you know when to do that. When I first started doing COBOL, it was like, oh, he's the uh, computer guy, just give him what he wants. But I got to talk <laughs> to the customers. And then I became a knowledge engineer. So then I had my domain experts sitting elbow to elbow with me hours every week. Just learning what he knew, learning what I was trying to do, demonstrating at each step of the way. And that is the thing that, you know, I, I think that's, you know, ideally in every project, you'd have the business person, the IT people living together and 
It doesn't work that way. But that is that level of communication where you're going to get the most effective systems done as quickly as possible. But then you end up, well, we got N IT people and we got one domain expert or business person. So then you have to communicate both the requirements and the visceral understanding of what's really going on. It's not what's written. It's, wait a minute, well, he said this, but they really are trying to do that. So let's not lose sight of what the real goal was because it was written in a requirements document. So then you have the daily standups where you try to share your learnings within the group. And you know, when you have four or five people in a standup, it's not 15 minutes. It's you get down, you sit in the room, you talk about what everybody's doing, figure out who needs help. And you do that daily. And it doesn't take 15 minutes. It takes as long as it takes. And that's, again, it's a question of scale. You know, you go from a couple of people to, you know, a half dozen people and the problems come in when you have to get more and more people actively involved in parallel in a process that is centered around, I'm dealing with the customer, so I'm right on what they need. And so it, it really is about communication and people and then expanding out what's a one-on-one -on -one process to a one-on-six process to a you know, three agile sub teams in a team process. And somewhere you lose the customer because you got too much, you know, I got too much overhead involved in coordinating the sub teams and the meetings and the sprints and the cards and the whatever. The thing that is, is I've always found is if you can get close to the requirements, the people that need it and have them actively involved in seeing what you're doing, get that uh, business involvement, not just, you know, dollars, but actual involvement, that is probably the single most important determinant of success of a, a new development kind of effort. Absolutely. Yeah. You yeah. gotta know what they're what problem they're trying to solve. Right. Yeah. That's how you that's how you find out what problem they want to solve. I think maybe as engineers we're 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 blessed with a system thinking and whole holistic systems. You know, you can't just, hey, I want to fly faster. Okay, well we can't go as far. Wait, what? I want to carry more. Okay, well, we can't fly as fast, huh? I mean, there is no, you can't just accelerate. Hey, I want to do all the UX design. Okay, well, you should. Oh, don't do that. Uh, and, and I think the the other, you know, the, that's one way to sum that up is risk mitigation, understanding what things are important to know now, what things do I need to know ahead of time, what don't I need? Um, and, you know, that that's another unfortunate fallacy a lot of big a lot of organizations do way too much upfront work or consequently sometimes they don't do enough like to me you have to have enough of a sense of what the problem domain is enough a sense of what the architecture is i don't need you know i don't need the details down the middle name i just might need to know i need a user or i need a you know a, a mortgage application or you know not all in so it's kind of understanding that that all that upfront work could have been delivered more just in time. And somehow you need to learn how to differentiate between you know, like what, what risks are you mitigating by doing too much upfront and what risks are you actually causing in terms of now having that, that sense of, oh my gosh, we did all that work. We, you know, we have a 50 page document, we have to do it all. Right now you're actually losing optionality, you're baking in things that you might not have needed to have baked in that early in the process and that's a risk as well so you know, these are hard concepts sometimes easy to say but hard to do yeah i've got a client who uh dedicated three people for a year to a analysis and design of a system and then three weeks into code they threw it all away so they wasted three years of now maybe they had to waste those spend those three years to know <laughs> that their three weeks of code were no good but they discovered that their critical flaws in what they modeled for a year three people and they weren't too happy about that i got to come in after that <laughs> yeah and, it, and it's about sorry jeff you know it's, it's, it's follow up and it's it's about when you know i'm coaching teams right now when when i see things like that it's a great opportunity one uh, i think somebody was talking about i'll know it when i see it i might have been james um you know but the the reaction that i try to help the team get to is all right that was despite you did all kinds of mock-ups you did all kinds of work up front and it was still wrong so what do we learn from this we learn maybe how can we more quickly get to the point where we see it because you you might not be right right and you know so it's things like that that you need to work on you know how to accelerate that learning 
and don't take all that upfront time if you could have figured out what's the riskiest part of this. Don't wait. Try to find that out ASAP. Yeah, so I think uh, that's a, a missing thing from, uh, well, maybe not uh, stressed enough, but uh, risk identification, right? So which thing, what are our known unknowns, right? You know, do I channel uh, uh, Defense Secretary Cheney. Uh, Cheney? Feld, right? Known unknowns. What are the known unknowns? Because there's a bunch of unknown unknowns too, but at least what are the ones we know? And let's go start to do something about those. And um, it's, know, it's interesting that, that we as people would rather be wrong than admit we don't know something. Ah, uh, well, got to grow up. <laughs> <laughs> I used to think I knew everything. I've learned a lot since then. All right. So it's been 20 years. We've obviously got some challenges going on right now. There's a bunch of new, newer things that are starting to emerge. We've touched on MVP as a, not, not a new, but a, you know, it's 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 a newer type of concept. You've touched on a little bit as well. The idea of of uh, mobbing is a relatively newer concept um, that that has taken popularity um, as 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 building on the pairing um, practices. Um, there's div dev biz sec ops and every other version of ops in there as well. Um, how do these new practices fit in? Um, how do these new practices fit in? How do these lead into perhaps the future of, of working in agile ways? All of those things, the mobbing, biz DevOps, biz dev, well, uh, SecOps. Yeah. So we're talking about automating boring things, right? I, making it so that when we make a change here, we can deliver it, right? Because the world wants stuff faster. Um, I got to tell you, I'm not surprised by it. And I don't know why it's not just called extreme programming extended. Um, right. And if you read the, the no uh, pragmatic programmer back in 1998, they said, if you're doing something boring, automate it. It's like, yeah, but that's hard. Yeah, but do it. Right. Hard is fun. <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah, I, I, w I would agree. I'm, I often said, you know, if I found myself doing the same thing by about the third time, I'm looking to automate it. Um, and even in architecture, like I want, I want the boring bits. That's one of the reasons I love Rails, for example, is it got, it basically embodied a, a, like an architecture that, that I helped create back in the, in the mid nineties, very, very similar kind of a, you know, the, the problem domain drives everything. There's a bunch of boilerplate crap to get it from, you know, the database up to the UI and back again, but that's all boring. So templatize the crap out of that, put it, you know, bury that in, in, you know, whatever classes. And if you change things, change it everywhere. And, and instead spend your money, i.e. your time and energy, delighting the customer with things at the, you know, at, at the, at the solution space, you know, not all this boilerplate crap that nobody, nobody sees or cares about. And so I think, yeah, the, these, to me, DevOps is a natural evolution. I see somebody putting that in there. I would agree, Kevin, that it's about, you know, if you, if you marry lean and agile principles, how can I drive some of the, you know, some of the waste out of the system? How can I drive out some of the wait times? Uh, how can I, um, I like to say, fix it in process, right? Get like back in 95 in this IBM manufacturing execution system that the same process is C++. You know, we had it, I basically said, look, you know, I, again, I'm an arrow guy that kind of learned how to code and do object modeling and stuff like that, but I'm not, not a, not the sysadmin. So I, I made sure our team made it so e I, I basically gave the edict, like make it so easy that even I can press the build button and start it and, and get the server, you know, so that, that in the last one out, hit the build button. And in the morning we come in and either find error messages and we do all kinds of advanced things to help make things automated. Back then, automated, you know, even metrics and heuristics, um, things like, uh, you know, ways to analyze the code or code smells, stuff like that. Stuff that you can automate, automate. I, I, that's why I say be lazy, because that usually makes you do more fun stuff instead of the boring, mundane. But it's much easier to do the boring and mundane. It's much easier to treat things like a one-off 
much easier just to follow a process without a sense of the value or not that whatever step you're doing is generating. Great question from uh, Greg in the chat here as well. Um, have there been issues or circumstances? I, I'm going to go back and, and, and look over the last 20 years. Uh, I'm trying to go into the future right now, but I, I want to catch Greg's question here, and I should have got it before we moved into the future. Uh, but Greg's asking about, have there been circumstances or situations in the last 20 years um, where a tweak to the principles or not being able to follow them has been warranted or has made sense to you? The principles? The 12 and not the four? Is that what you mean, Greg? Or do you mean the four tenants? How, how about all 16? Let's 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 group them together. <laughs> yes, right. either either or both. Um, the question is broad. I mentioned the four. <laughs> the four, I, like tell me what's wrong with the four. The four, I think, all right, this is immodest as hell. Uh, I said it at the 10th, 10th year anniversary. And I think of it in a similar manner, but on about a thousandth or a a hundred thousandth of the scale that the declaration of independence the the what happened in the united states you know a, an odd bunch of folks got together sort somewhat randomly and created something that pretty much stands the test of time because i think just like it got to the essence of governing peoples i think the four bullets got to the essence of software development so essences don't usually change that's why I would say those four bullets, uh, I'm not touching them because I don't think you can quibble with them. Now, 12 principles, you know, there might be some things you could probably fiddle with, but I'll just stop there and see what James thinks. Well, I'll just, I'll add to the four points. Um, in a way, they don't mean anything. Um, they're not telling you to do anything. <laughs> they're just saying, you know, work with each other. It, does that, oh, over processes and tools. You mean you don't need compilers anymore? We're gonna, no, of course you need tools and processes, uh, but work with each other. I've I had to bring up the this old thing just because I can't remember it. Um, working software over comprehensive documentation. It's like, yeah, but we need documentation. Yeah, okay, but if you document it and it doesn't work, uh, you know, what does a customer use? Okay, um, customer collaboration over contract. Yeah, but we can't do work without contracts. Um, okay. But you, you know, the contracts are when things go wrong. So let's, you know, work together. I mean, we don't do contracts because things are going to go right. We, you know, it's lawyers need something to do. And what if somebody screws you? You're going to have to have some recourse. Okay. You know, but what, wouldn't we like a trusting relationship instead? And uh, you're not going to follow the plan, responding to change. It's like, yeah, well, let's have a plan, but realize it's going to change. Uh, you know, so it's not saying to do anything, it's just saying, you know, react adapt uh be nice to each other work together <laughs> yeah and I, and I think something that that i've really began to stress in the past five or so years is is humility mm -hmm. shockingly um and <laughs> and curiosity but the humility comes even at the top and the bottom of, of the manifesto by the mere statement of we are uncovering not we figured it all out wait, everybody pay attention. We found, you know, the holy grail of software development. Now, we're still in the process of uncovering it and we're doing it by helping others do it, right? So it's it's not even like, no, we've just gone away and gazed at our navel and, and figured this all out. And at the bottom, we add, oh, by the way, this, this is not, uh, you know, a, like I'm a nut about, documentation at the right level for the right things that are not discoverable, but not everything. Uh, so the, the this over that is another expression of humility. And, and the fact that you got to use your brain. So those two brackets of, of those four bullets, I only noticed it maybe a year or so ago that, oh, sweet. <laughs> That's pretty good on our part, whoever the hell wrote that. Um, but that, you know, that's something to to not lose sight of that that kind of, I, I treat most things in software as a hypothesis. Hey, I think this feature would be great. Okay, good hypothesis. How are you gonna prove it or disprove it, right? And, and you know, all the way from a, a small bit of code that you write, you know, via a test or feature or the whole damn product. It's a hypothesis that someone wants it or that you, you know, whatever your hypothesis is. Um, so I think that's important to note 
about the manifesto and the 12 principles. Yeah, uh, uh, James, do you have any favorites that you might want to tweet? I, I couldn't, I probably couldn't quote one. No, nah, I got to go look at them. Yeah. Well, we, a- <laughs> I used to joke when I remember doing some keynotes back in the day in Java one and stuff like that. And, and I'd watch other people give talks and recite the agile manifesto. I, I remember one gentleman I went up to and said, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> he goes, I, Oh, I practiced. I think, you, you know, I practice and practice and practice, you know, just so I could say it. And I think it's something that you need to live and, and absorb. And it just becomes part of how you process the things that we do for a living in building software. Cool, Greg, I hope that uh, that was the answer that you were looking for, or if not, at least it answered, uh, it answered the question, hopefully. What's, what's Greg's answer? I'd like to hear Greg's because he must, he might have something in mind. <laughs> well, well, no, I, I was mostly interested in your perspectives, but I'm, I'm surprised. I'm surprised at the blend of, of humility and conviction in these responses. And it, it seems like there, there may be room somewhere for amendments uh, to, to leverage John's uh, uh, Declaration of Independence notion here. <laughs> um, I think it's really good work, don't get me wrong, but the world's changed a lot. And I'm wondering you know, who has eyes on, on possible amendments. The next generation, but uh, I could I could propose an amendment right now, which is, uh, and if you need to do something different than what we said here, then go ahead. <laughs> I love it. Sheila's <laughs> asked a question, which, funny enough, Sheila was actually exactly where I was going to go. Um, I was going to ask it a little bit differently. Um, because one of the things that I hear is that agile is dead now that co-location isn't as possible, you know, you know, in this, in this remote and virtual world. And, and so agile is dead and Sheila brings it up as point number six in, in the manifesto that the most effective way of communication is through face to face. I'm, I, I'm, Sheila asks the question, what does that mean to you today? Um, I'm kind of curious as, as well. What do you think of the future of Agile, given that we're in a remote and distributed world? And the fact is, we're probably going to continue down this road for the foreseeable future. I, for one, would like to get back with some people, even though, you know, it's a, as an engineer, I'm perfectly happy in my cave working on code. Um, yeah, and every once in a while, it's fun to go out and drink some beer after like a kick-ass release or something. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've long since been working with remote teams starting before the manifesto um, in, in Russia, you know, so I commutes never seemed so long as when I had to fly eight time zones uh, <laughs> to go to work. So I can play both sides of that. It, in for sure, we are social creatures that use all kinds of non-communic, non-verbal communication skills to help get things done more effectively, so to speak. Uh, but at the same time, having that remoteness and that asynchronousness, <laughs> I'm sure it's not, can also drive very effective other techniques around documenting just enough, having that, that quick asynchronous communication, even if you only have a few hours of time. So you can play both, both angles. And I actually went, went to, to St. Petersburg, Russia for two weeks a month for years. So yeah, there was both going on. And I, that was good because I could then get contact with customers and things like that, but then get contact with the development team and in between do the not so efficient non face to face, but still it was effective because we often, the, the approach that I take to development is doing just enough up front to kind of lay enough of the groundwork in person as much as possible so that other things are, are more um, in context and easier for people to act autonomously because that, that's the key. The difference between control and autonomy is if you have a vision, whether it's for a feature or for the whole damn product, 
your team members can then exercise their brains and act autonomously in your absence. You don't, you know, it doesn't have to always filter through the product owner or the scrum master or anything like that. And so I think the, this world, if you're prepared to understand effective ways to run a team, co-located or not, you can take advantage of Zoom and Slack and other, other ways to communicate asynchronously. Yeah, that asynchronous communication has become more and more prevalent uh, through things like Teams and Slack uh, and other uh, messaging tools, especially in the last uh, eight, 18 months, for sure. Um, There's, uh, there are other tools besides those. And uh, there I'd are, be, I'd be, I'd be happy to share a little bit about, um, I started doing remote training about eight years ago, um, kind of out of need, you know, my, my customer had to talk with me on Wednesday about all the things to do to the website. And on Thursday, we realized we didn't have any business. We better start another line to the business, which is remote delivered training. So I could hang around in Florida more. And uh, right. And so, uh, so we changed our priorities overnight uh, and started to go down that road. But so uh, doing a remote training in Zoom and WebEx is okay. Uh, but there are some other, there's another cool thing, which I discovered my, uh, uh, and I'd be happy to give you guys a little tour of it, or maybe at the end, I could give a tour, uh, but that'd be great. Actually, I'd be interested in seeing want that. Me to look at it right now. Okay. Well, maybe before we do that, I'm, I'm just, I, I've got one last question kind of here. Um, okay. if, if I can, is, is that just as we sort of look at the future of agile, we're starting to see it applied outside software development in, in many areas. In fact, at the Agile TO meetup in Toronto tomorrow night, there's a quick talk with Evan Laybourne, who is the president of the Business Agility Institute. And that's uh, on Meetup as well. If anyone's interested, they can find it by going to Meetup and searching for Agile TO. And Evan is gonna be speaking on business agility tomorrow. And I'm wondering, James and John, since the software or the Agile Manifesto specifically says right in the top, it's the Agile Manifesto for Software Development. And we talk about things like working with software over comprehensive documentation. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the proliferation of these principles and values uh, expanding to areas outside of software development and how that might look in the future. Yeah, uh, I've done it with a couple of teams in the past year, one being like a client services team that you know handles you might call them tickets you know they, they help customers or manage you know account managers and um help get licensed subscriptions and whatever else and then a, another client that was they make uh software for schools universities to help student engagement you know so there's sort of a the team that we worked with was for onboarding you know, all right, cool, we sold this. We're gonna go outfit such and such a university. Cool, how do we do it, right? They have a whole process where they gotta ingest things from the, from the university system. So that was a process. And, and we applied lean agile principles. We applied a lot of the, the same things I might do when starting up a new product. You know, the same things I would work with from the subject matter experts to the you know, boots on the ground, the team doing the work. You know, and it, shockingly, the first exercise is, what's the system purpose? What's your business purpose? What's your value? Like, can you just define value? You know, and so for software, it's features and it's, you know, outcomes that we expect to, to get from building software. But from an onboarding team, you know, they were able to express the value of what it means to successfully onboard a unit, you know, a client. And for the client services, it was it was the types of things that that had to do with fulfilling the their customer needs. So, to your point, I would submit. Okay, yeah, maybe working software, but even yeah, okay, maybe some of that software esque stuff doesn't quite apply. But uh, the onboarding it did, because we actually helped them change a batch process for integrations. You can imagine it's a nightmare, right? It, like I'm thinking, oh gosh, anytime I, you have to integrate with somebody else's piece of crap system, that just sucks. Speak, speak of, I ain't fixed bidding that. Um, but anyway, 
you know, so in, in some sense, that group probably did have a sense of working software, things they could show, algorithms that they could run, things they could test, and help them break that down through some lean and agile principles about single piece flow and, you know, small sizes. And so, yeah, even though it says software at the top, I think a lot of people have figured out, yeah, it's kind of, how do you just work better as, as a group to satisfy your customers' needs? Yeah, so uh, I'll see. I agree with that, John. Um, in a way, there's nothing new here. Uh, in the 80s, we were learning TQM, which meant uh, total quality management. And what's a problem that we need to solve? Hmm, do we have a hypothesis of what, make, what might make that better? Should we try that hypothesis out? Um, yeah, oh, it worked. Let's do more of it. Oh, it didn't work. Can we change that, right? So there's feedback loops. You know, Now, PDCA and uh, total quality management, they had nothing to do with software. And I remember my uh, CEO at the time, or general manager coming in saying, James, you guys have to get on board with uh, total quality management. It's like, sorry, John, we can't do it. Our cycle times are six months. So we don't have to. And considering he had no idea what we we're doing, we didn't have to. So we didn't have to do PDCA. You know, now I can, I've got a f less than five minute cycle. Lots of times when I'm in the zone, uh, we could have done it. We just had, we were not creative enough to know what to do. Uh, so certainly the ideas of that, that we've adopted, we didn't actually, and we're rediscovering them, I think in a way um, that this working in iterations with feedback loops, stuff that's been going on for a long time in invention and discovery uh, and, turn, and be creating products and things like that. And uh, I think about, you know, so my world I work in is embedded systems. And if you go talk to an embedded systems engineer and you describe test-driven development, they would say, oh, we can't do that. Uh, no one could do that. It's like, oh, well, yeah, you could actually. Um, managing the dependency on, you know, you've talked about databases, all of you. Managing dependency on hardware is the same thing about as managing dependency on hardware. It's the same thing, same problem. They look different. They've been hidden by nature, but they're the same kind of problem with same kinds of solutions. And so a creative person with, that sees, you know, what we're doing in software could say, hmm, we could do that in hardware too. Uh, or we could do that in UI development, or we could do that in uh, car designs or advertising, <laughs> right? Fast feedback loops. They're everywhere now. Everything's happening so fast. That's really cool. I know there's a couple of um, other things that we wanted to talk about. Jeff, I think you had an announcement that you wanted to make. And then James, you wanted to introduce us to a tool that you're using in your training that I'm really curious to see and learn and learn more about. Um, but before we do, are there any other things before we jump to those, maybe John or Kevin? This is tricky because everyone on here seems to have the same name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is which is making it tricky to to uh, to call it stall. Uh, you were the John I was talking to there, uh, and Kevin. Um, if if you've got anything, and Jeff, uh, if you've got anything before we see James is uh, uh, James going to share with us this collaboration uh, system he's got platform. Um, I I don't have anything. I just wanted to uh, throw out there a quick thank you to all of the meetup groups for getting together and and especially uh jeff john and james for for being willing to to come here and do this for us i, I really appreciate it um and jeff uh pulcini i think you've got uh, a quick announcement as well right yeah i do um as a matter of fact i'm gonna i'm just gonna grab a couple of quick slides here because i think it's easier to just see than do anything um, we, about uh, three years ago, we got together down here in Pittsburgh and, and started to do a, a, a gathering. And uh, it's turned out to be fairly successful. And we've we've uh, done it uh, every year since. And this year, we are doing this in November. We've, we've actually, our philosophy here is that Agile is a group participation sport, and we can't afford the silos. And so we try to drag in other groups of other people that are very interested in Agile. And so we with IBA and the Software Excellence, Pit QA, uh, to put together this 2021 Agile. And we're, we're uh, actually going to do uh, two things uh, for people who are new and uh, we're going to have an intro to Agile Day. It's all virtual Zoom. 
Um, anybody who's interested, we can, we can uh, sort of accommodate you in that. Um, so yeah, students, students and grads, we've got a uh, line into some universities that want to hear about this. So we're going to, to make this reasonable for them. Um, uh, let's see. The second day is a little bit more intense. And this is this is really was the heart of the gathering. Um, our theme is individuals and interactions. And that I personally, I feel that that's one of the top uh, uh, the top uh, principles or tenets that we have to, to look at. And so uh, we've got three tracks. Uh, we keep the cost absolutely minimal. Uh, it's going to be in person, at least that's our thought right now. Uh, we're at the Regional Learning Alliance here in Cranberry. It's a great venue, 125 bucks. If you want to come virtual, 85 bucks. Um, let's see. Last thing. Uh, in terms of an announcement, uh, is that we are looking for volunteers for this. Uh, this is a fairly big deal to try and put on. So uh, moderators, Zoom coordinators, uh, this third one is mentors. And uh, there were 40 some odd people on this call. And to me, that means 40 some odd mentors. Uh, there's not anybody who doesn't have something to share. And there's not anybody that doesn't have something to learn. And I think we've We've seen that modeled here, you know, with, with I mean, we've got two of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto and and, uh, and uh, one of the first things that came out is we're still learning. And uh, I am very grateful for that. So uh, please get in touch with me, uh, help other people who want to learn a little bit more about Agile, about your journey. We've got a great platform in which we uh, can have some folks share. It's called Lattice. We'll deal with that uh, then. But uh, th these are some of the things that we need. So uh, get in touch with me, please. And uh, if you'd like to help and uh, um, promote Agile, I'm gonna go maybe one bridge a little too far here and, uh, and say that uh, as John and uh, Stahl and I talked a little bit and other folks, um, this certainly started in Pittsburgh, but we were even talking about rotating this around the, this region uh, in terms of next year and the years after. So God willing, you know, we'll promote Agile and we'll have a great, a good deal of fun doing it. That's it. That's my, uh, that's my spiel. Excellent. I think we're done sharing. Thanks, Jeff. Cool. Yeah. Good job. All right. Well, I'm going to say thanks as well. I'll add my thanks, James and John. Mm -hmm. I had a blast chatting with you folks. I hope everyone else had a, as much fun as I did. Um, that was great. Great comments uh, through the chat as well. Uh, and if, if no one has anything else, James, I, I'd love to pass it over to you and uh, and invite you.